Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 22 of Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business. Gail Porter, our intrepid astronaut, is trying to get to the moon. And thanks to the wonders of the Maneuver Node system, we are getting predictions that just come and go by the slightest uh, a modification of my maneuver vectors. It is very strange. I know that there should be an encounter happening here, but the game will not show it to me. So I end up more or less eyeballing it. The problem is I want to get my periaps within 5,000 kilometers off the moon. And the game, it's, uh, the game is not showing me anything that close, but I know it's in there. It comes in one side, goes out the other, and it disappears in between. So I pretty much set my maneuver node that is a bit of guesswork. So I pretty much guess where I'm going to go and then make this tiny little burn. Now, this is actually rather annoying to do simply due to the fact that the spacecraft is rotating and killing the rotation every time I want to make a maneuver is going to get old really fast. Then, of course, we have to point it back in the correct direction to make sure that we're getting the solar power we need to keep the life support systems functioning. But anyway, after all that guesstimation, we do get an encounter. And we're actually pretty close, about 1,600 kilometers. The problem is that the exit orbit does not bring us anywhere near the Earth. So what I need to do is actually accelerate past the moon so that I still come within 5,000 kilometers of the moon, but it doesn't mess my orbit up sufficiently that I don't return back to Earth. Uh, so obviously you'd normally do this as a free return trajectory, but I just totally guessed where my orbit, where my, you know, translunar injection should be. Actually, I haven't been guessing. I've mostly been trying to go straight from launch into a translunar injection because otherwise the cryogenic liquid oxygen just evaporates and leaves me without all the delta V I need. Instead, I need to have I need to burn a bunch of delta V trying to get back home because I didn't get a free return trajectory. But yes, this is what we end up with. What we do is we accelerate past the earth or sorry, past the moon and I adjust my velocity so that I travel, I don't get quite as close to the moon. And in the end, I do get an encounter that's a whole lot straighter and I slow myself down quite a bit. And that does ultimately, for the princely sum of a few hundred meters per second delta V, it lets me get home. It's far from ideal. I would have really loved that extra science from getting within 100 kilometers of the sun, but... Unfortunately, my inability to actually plot a decent translunar injection means that I cannot take advantage of that. Instead, I'm going to fly past at a rather a arm's length distance. But I'm sure Gail doesn't mind. I mean, she's the first Kerbal to ever fly to this great distance. Over 375,000 kilometers away from Earth. That is over one and a quarter seconds between her saying something and the Earth actually respond, uh, noticing. And then, of course, another one and a quarter seconds before she gets anything. Yeah, two and a half seconds is the kind of round trip that we expect. It's a good thing that she is up there controlling this directly. She's not a pilot, but she can actually hold this spacecraft in the correct orientation. So yes, firing the engines, holding the, the, holding the position manually, and this is where it gets kind of dull because I have to do this for a really long time. Time accelerating, thankfully, so you don't have to watch the whole thing. Anyway, look, if you want a free return trajectory from the moon, what you need to be doing is crossing the orbit of the moon much more rapidly than we do during a regular Kerbal encounter. When you're doing a free return trajectory, your uh, apoapse is actually way above the moon's orbit. And that means when you're crossing the moon's orbit, you're actually, you have a large radial velocity component. I mean, what you're aiming for in the moon's reference frame is the angle between your like infinity orbit and the moon and the Earth should be the same going in and going out. And that way, all you've done is flipped around your radial velocity and you're coming back towards the Earth uh, pretty much with the same la uh, lateral velocity and with the radial velocity now going inwards. And this makes probably very little sense but to a lot of people. Point is, you can't just do a regular Kerbal injection. You actually have to really work 
at it to get a proper free return trajectory. Of course, we have engines and we are able to mi fix these mistakes. I have 31 meters per second of delta V left. I'm lucky that I was able to do it with such a small margin. There was a very real chance that Gale would not have been able to fix her orbit sufficiently and therefore would have been doomed to, well, stay in space forever. Truthfully, what I would have done was raise my uh, periaps relative to the moon to make sure that the moon didn't mess up my orbit enough and therefore I would be able to just get the free return that I needed. That was the option that I could have taken but it would have been obviously really embarrassing because it would have meant that I didn't get to complete this mission that we've failed several times already and we've already killed Arcady Simmerman. But we have left the moon's sphere of influence and now we are coming back. Look, that is the kind of orbit you would expect to be on if you were on a free return trajectory, going in and going out. And because you're crossing the orbit so rapidly, it means you have to be more accurate in your uh, targeting, right? The standard Kerbal maneuver where you come up and you just hang out there for long enough for the moon to catch you, that doesn't give you a free return trajectory. Anyway, now that we're out the other side of the moon's sphere of influence, we can make a, we make a couple of changes to uh, adjust the periaps. I uh, wasn't sure what the periaps should be for a lunar return with these heat shields, I haven't really done a lunar return with these heat shields before. In fact, while I was testing this, I discovered that my install was somehow giving me only low Earth orbit heat shields instead of the lunar heat shields, and that wouldn't work very well for Gale Porter. Although, I will point out that a porter is a type of beer made with brown malt, which is basically um, grains that have been overcooked and browned to give the beer the colour. So this would be the kind of equivalent, you know, cooking her in the capsule. But 500 kilometers above the, the, the surface, we ditch the second stage, we switch over to internal power. We now have no solar panels and we don't have any uh, extra life support. We just have the onboard life support, which should be good for a couple of days. And that might actually be necessary if, say, for example, I don't get my periap set up correctly. You'll notice, by the way, there is still this bug in the game where if you time accelerate using physics warp, the distance to the object changes, so doubling the speed halves the distance. This is a very odd behaviour which I've never had a good explanation from the devs about, and I wish they'd fix it. Uh oh, I'm hearing thunder. I have clearly upset the Kerbal Gods with my comment about bugs. Oh no, wait, that's just the other stage. Then again, maybe the Kerbal Gods are in fact angry and they're demonstrating their power by making the other space, uh, the other bit of spacecraft, you know, explode. Oh, I like how that last one actually caused the entire landscape to light up. Anyway, it was about this point where uh, Arcady Simmerman met his untimely end. But we, we are doing just fine. We're skimming through the atmosphere and slowing down. The atmosphere is maybe is hot, red, there are flames running everywhere, but unfortunately the G-forces are not building up high enough, and I do in fact skip off back into space. Yeah, this is what, of course, you've heard about in Apollo 13. People are always asking me, hey, I remember Apollo 13, they were talking about skipping off into space, surely that doesn't happen. And I'm like, well, technically, they do skip off back into space, and according to Newton's laws, they will eventually come back. The problem is, by the time they come back, they would have run out of life support. The good news is we should have over 24 hours of life support on this thing, and uh, time to periaps is just over six and a quarter hours, so we should get around just fine. What a beautiful view of Australia. And then we come back, and once again, we're going to slow ourselves down by skimming through the atmosphere with as much aerodynamic drag as possible. I'm wondering if we should tell Gale to open the windows because of course that does increase the drag on many vehicles. Maybe she opened the door, that might work. I I've heard actually it's possible to steer some light aircraft by trying to open the doors. It's not something I would advise trying based upon you hearing it in one of my videos. I've talked about some rather crazy stuff that you should not ever try to do in a real aircraft ever. Anyway, second time around, and it looks like we have just punched 
through the atmosphere and are heading back into space for another go around. Toga, Toga, Toga! Yeah, that's what Gale's shouting over comms, just to make it sound like, I meant that! I really meant that! And third time lucky. Really, what she's doing is she's messing with the heads of the recovery fleet. She's like, I'm coming down for real this time, and they're getting their aircraft in the air, their search helicopters are getting an alert, and she's like, Ha! Psych! I won't be back for another few hours. Of course, she'll, uh... She'll realize that that was a really bad joke when she lands in the water and they can't pick her up because they're in the wrong place. But really, for real, Gail Porter has survived the rigors of re-entry, the parachute is deploying, and she will be a true hero of the Kerbal people. Having flown past the moon, seen the far side of the moon, and broken all the altitude and speed records that there are. With her bold voyage, faith has been restored in this Kerbal space program. Faith that there's a pretty good chance that you won't die if we launch you into space. I mean, it's important not to underestimate how much that will uh, help or assist in our recruiting for uh, future missions. We'd already transmitted most of the science back, but uh, I guess we do get some science for recovering the vehicle from the, the lunar orbit. Anyway, uh, I decided to repurpose this booster and start a new mission. During simulations, things happened, and I was recording. <laughs> it's always fun to see things that don't quite go according to plan, even if this is actually in a simulation. So yeah, what was happening is one of the clamps, the launch clamps, were clipping inside the boosters. That stopped them actually launching into the air. And that caused the whole thing to flip over, and then the, there was no way for me to point the spacecraft back at the sky without increasing my angle of attack too much and tearing the rocket apart due to aerodynamic stresses. It was basically a spectacular, rapid, unplanned disassembly. As I said, good thing it was a simulation. We solved those problems and then we built the real thing. So yeah, all we've done is we've added a probe stage on instead of the capsule. We're still using the same launch stage. And actually, this thing has way more delta V. Notice we're up over 15 kilometers per second of delta V when we launch this thing. But also note, I have not gone to my regular four times regular speed. Uh, because for all my pre-planning and simulating, I made a major mistake. Can you see what major mistake that I'm making? heading towards the moon here, adjusting my orbit, obviously pitching over towards the horizon, adjusting my inclination, picking up speed. It's all looking like a perfect launch, but can anybody see the huge mistake that I was making? <laughs> so look, while I leave this as an exercise to the viewer, uh, let's just talk about the rest of the rocket. This is a spacecraft which is going to the moon. But this one is going to stay there. It's going to carry a camera, which is going to take some photographs. And it's going to carry a biological payload, which is slightly more compact than a full-size Kerbal. And after collecting data in the vicinity of the moon, it will detach a return vehicle, which will return to the Earth. That's why the whole thing has so much Delta V, because it's going to go to the moon and then it's going to return from the moon. It's going to get into orbit. And then it's going to have to break orbit to return to Kerbin. So this is kind of the next step up in terms of Delta V requirements. Anyway, if you hadn't noticed, if you hadn't figured it out, look at my relative inclination. Yeah, I was actually turning my spacecraft to the north when I was supposed to be turning it to the south. I was essentially going into an orbit which was perpendicular to the one I was supposed to. The great thing is, this spacecraft has so much Delta V, it literally can afford to make a 90 degree turn in the middle of its launch. And it will still have enough to get there. It may not have enough uh, fuel to do all the stuff that it wanted, but yeah, I, uh, I turned the whole thing basically 90 degrees, which is about as bad as it can get, short of actually pointing it in the opposite direction. Although that did actually happen with a Russian spacecraft, I think it was called Polyus, maybe? I, I, I forget. It was a laser that was supposed to fly in space, a literal anti-missile laser, and it was launched on the side of the Energia rocket. And for some technical reason which escapes me at this particular time, 
the engines on that were mounted upside down, so after the staging manoeuvre, the whole spacecraft was supposed to flip through 180 degrees and then fire its engines to get into orbit. Due to a bug in the program, it did do 180 degrees, and then it did another 180 degrees. Then it fired its engines and of course fell back to Earth. We didn't really hear about this at the time because it was just about as top secret as you can make something that's uh, sitting on top of the biggest rocket in the world. I mean, after the mission, it was announced as a successful suborbital test of their new launch vehicle because it was, in fact, the first uh, of only two launches of the Energia rocket. Anyway, we are not launching anything quite so big. We are actually a lot smaller than most launch vehicles. We're getting ourselves on course towards the moon. And thanks to the wonders of editing, you don't need to see me faffing around with maneuver nodes. Instead, you just need to wait for the right time for my spacecraft to actually fire its engines. Yeah, Energia was supposed to be basically the Soviet competitor to the shuttle, right? It was able to launch something like 100 tons into low Earth orbit. And the second mission was the one that launched the Buran shuttle. The first one was the one that they tried to launch the laser in space. I mean, that's pretty brave to put a unique spacecraft on your very first test flight of your rocket, which is bigger than anything else that has ever flown. Or at least flown out of Russia. Anyway, the Queen Bee is go for orbital insertion. We are not going to get all the way up to our translunar injection with this uh, Carolox engine, but we're going to get pretty close to it. And the truth is that after the initial translunar injection burn, the Carolox engine has to be dumped because the liquid oxygen will evaporate too quickly. I'm still confident that there may be enough fuel in the, the two remaining stages to put it into a stable lunar orbit and then of course return the payload to Earth. But we're going to collect the data first and find out. Now I will be clear actually that I have unlocked a number of new engines. There's some uh, Hydrolox engines, different variations on these Carolox engines, but uh, it's actually a lot of effort to go through and read the numbers and redesign the spacecraft. So I'm, I'm just kind of working with the things that have been most reliable for me. So I'm going pretty much for the best specific impulse and then hoping that uh, hoping that'll work. I haven't done hydrogen, uh, oxygen, largely because I suspect that the hydrogen oxygen will evaporate far too quickly for me to actually uh, spend any time in orbit setting up a maneuver. And there we go to our final stage. We only need to pick up another few hundred meters per second here, but we're already heading upwards up towards the moon. Now in this case, we're not going for a free return. We are just trying to get in and use the least amount of fuel possible. So we want an encounter with the lowest velocity possible. And that means ideally our Apo apps should exactly match with the moon's orbit. That means there will be zero radial velocity when the moon actually picks me up. And then I should be able to put my spacecraft, uh, make that all important burn at perilune and put it into a circular orbit. If you were paying attention, you might have noticed after that whole uh, hilarity with the inclination, I did actually manage to get it to within like 0.7 degrees of the lunar inclination anyway from that initial launch. So. Uh, for all the massive errors, I did actually end up with a really pretty well-aligned orbit that didn't need a huge amount of work or a huge amount of delta V to get it in. That being said, we are just about as far as possible from the ascending or descending node, so it's not like we're going to end up in the plane of the, of the moon. Not that that's ideal anyway. There we go. Now just tweak this, tweak this, and 166 kilometers. That is a good approach distance if you ask me. And it's also a good place to leave this mission. We'll be back in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.